Today on Piercing with Scott, I have a real treat for you. We get a chance to sit down and talk to Master Piercer and a real pioneer of this industry, Elaine Angel. Hi Elaine, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Scott. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. Now, I'd like to talk to you a lot about the beginning of the Gauntlet, which was one of the first body piercing studios in America. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you got involved with it? Sure. Well, it started in 1975, and I'll admit I wasn't there on the scene that early, but that was when Jim Ward, who's my mentor and former boss, um, started Gauntlet in his home. And then it was in 1978 that they opened the first storefront. And as far as we know, it was the first piercing specialty studio in the United States. And I became a customer there in 1981 for the first time, and I was just wild for piercing, and I thought everybody should do it. And at this point, people didn't really know about piercing. It wasn't on the radar. It wasn't something that was happening in our society. So I brought friends, strangers, relatives, everybody I could get my hands on. I would talk them into getting pierced, and I would bring them into Gauntlet. And that was how I got to be friendly with Jim Ward. I ended up kind of um, helping him, assisting at some demonstrations he was doing, and I was just a relentless customer. And eventually, uh, I had gone to school and studied marketing and management, and then I put on a little business suit and took my resume, and I applied for a job as manager of Gauntlet when Jim was looking for a new manager. And so he interviewed me and, and did all the usual job interview questions, and then he said, all right, we'll give it a try. And then he said, by the way, how are your piercing skills? And I said, um, better than most. <laughs> and uh, so that was how it started. And that was still in the 80s. And piercing was really in its infancy then as an industry. Uh, other studios or some tattoo artists were piercing on the side. And it was starting to, to spread a little bit. But it really wasn't until the 90s that it exploded and became uh, something that was more ubiquitous and okay. found everywhere. How did you hear about the gauntlet? I mean, if it was one of the first places, the first, like, were you living by there or did you see someone with a piercing? Fortunately, I was living near there. And yes, I did see someone with a piercing. I was at a Renaissance festival and I met a couple. Uh, they happen to be deaf and I used to be a sign language interpreter and I saw that he had a pierced nipple and I approached them and talked to them about it and then they showed me her pierced nipples and I was like, oh my God, I have to do this. So I ran home and I pierced my own nipple terribly with a little hoop. I filed a point onto a, a hoop earring and shoved it through and I looked at that little crooked ring in the mirror and I, <laughs> I, I was like, well, that's not right. But they had told me, I couldn't even wait until the next day. As soon as I heard about it, yeah. I had to try it for myself. But then I realized, all right, I don't know what I'm doing. And they told me that where the place was that they got theirs done. And then I went down there and got it done the next day. That is awesome. Um, so nowadays we have ideas of what a piercing studio should look like. What was the gauntlet like back then? How was it different then than it is now? And was it very busy? Um, it was by appointment at that time, although if you walked in and you didn't have one, they would see you. Um, it was no, not nearly as busy as studios have become nowadays. It was pretty underground. It was primarily a gay community um, clientele. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim is a gay man and he's part of the leather community. And that was kind of the initial clientele. And then it sort of spread to the uh, pansexual BDSM community in the Southern California area locally. And then, then musicians and other people started getting in on it, but that was really where the roots were. And when I walked in, I definitely noticed the purple, um, well, it was very purple. Uh -huh. Purple's the piercing color. Uh, they had this wallpaper with, um, what are those called? Uh, peacock feather, peacock feather print wallpaper print. <laughs> and um, there was a back piercing area that was just curtained off. It wasn't particularly private. They did have the autoclave in the bathroom. Okay. And the shared bathroom. And it was a Harvey's chemclave, which uses uh, basically a, a formaldehyde <laughs> to sterilize. And it is 
stinky as can be and smells really toxic to be honest and actually is pretty toxic yes. so you know back in the day it was a little bit primitive compared to how things are now after they've improved over time um, but I would still say that the piercings were done safely and that uh, I, they never gave me an infection or anything like that it, there was you know certainly appropriate measures being taken to the best of their knowledge and ability and they did a good job even back then awesome so when you were brought on so did you get an apprenticeship by jim ward then is that how that worked or were you just kind of you're a piercer uh, it was definitely not the sort of apprenticeship that i have provided to my apprentices which uh -huh. have taken between one and a half and two years um i did tend to train my own staff at Gauntlet, and then once I opened my own studio in New Orleans, Rings Desire in the early 90s, mm. it wasn't like there was a bunch of trained piercers you could hire. It were, were, you know, not a lot of professionals out there still at the time. So uh, he did give me some training, but it definitely was not the level and intensity of training that we would think of as an apprenticeship now. But well, I would say that he did te teach me to pierce. I imagine, because I mean, like when I first started, it was um, in the 90s and there were still a lot of aha moments where it's like, oh, wait, I could do it cleaner this way or I could. I can't imagine the beginning stages. It's just you had to have constantly evolved and things changed all the time. It was interesting. It was a very exciting time. And even in the moment, it had this tremendous sense of of discovery and kind of importance. Like it was just like you could feel something was happening there as we were trying new piercings, new styles of jewelry, new techniques uh, and placements. And there was just this period of experimentation and just so much passion. We were all, all of us there so excited about it. And it, w it was a very exciting time that I look back on fondly. It's, I, I would love, I wish I could go back there and experience that. So back in the day, there really wasn't as many piercings as there is today, correct? I mean, there was only a couple staples or how many do you think there were? The core of Gauntlet's business was nipples and genitals. And that is actually what I specialize in today. I did throughout my career, all of the piercings that, that we were doing. Mm -hmm. But then when I became a guest piercer, it just sort of, was an organic process where I came to specialize in what I had started my career with. So it was initially mostly nipples and genitals and some septums. Uh, I, I did my first eyebrow piercing on camera on one of those shows in the eighties. And I remember doing the piercing and putting in the jewelry we used to hoop bar, uh, curve bars were not a regular inventory item at the time. So I put in that little 3 8 18 gauge hoop in his eyebrow and I looked at him and in all seriousness in the moment I said, you are a wild man. And I meant it like it was <laughs> it was really out there. And it's funny because he was a preppy looking guy too. Very nice gent. Anyway, so um, we, you know, they came along. Um, then there were more Lebrec piercings were fairly common. There were more and more of those. But the ear thing didn't really pop till later. We did. Uh, well, I did something that uh, I called a Niler, which later became called a Rook. So we were experimenting still back then. The, uh, I'm sorry, a Niler? Uh, Eric Niles was the name of the guy okay. I first did it on. So we a called Niler. it a Niler, and, um, but that didn't get in the magazine. And Eric Dakota, and I'm, I'm grateful. I like his name better, actually. Um, so Eric Dakota named that and popularized it along with the Doth and uh, some other things. So uh, we were experimenting back then, but there really wasn't that much popularity of ear piercings the way there is now. And symptoms were more co common than nostril piercings. Okay, okay. It's, that's weird because it's, it seems like they're real popular, then they stop for many years. Because it seemed like when I was in the 90s, it was, I was lucky if I did a couple of those a year. And now we're doing multiple a week, you know, multiple a day, I should say. So, yeah, times yeah. have changed and things evolve. So. Absolutely. There definitely have been cycles and flows of which piercings become popular. And I think social media is, to some extent, re responsible for that. And also celebrities and coming out with photos of their piercings. It and I think that drives helps. friends. 
So back in the gauntlet, there was, you hear three names all the time, Jim Ward, Fakir, Mushafar, and Doug Malloy. Like, were you friends with these people? Did you know these people as well? Is this all? Um, Doug, unfortunately, died before my time with Gauntlet, although I've heard many, many stories about him, and I feel like I know him. I didn't actually get to meet him, and I, I'm, I'm sad about that because, you know, his involvement is definitely, has definitely impacted my life and all of ours who are in the field. But um, Fakir and I worked together in San Francisco. So a lot of people assume San Francisco was the first branch, but it was in LA, in West Hollywood, that was the original branch from the 70s. And it wasn't until, uh, I think it was 1990, when the Gauntlet San Francisco opened, and Fakir lived up in that area and worked there, and I worked with him there. And also, you know, knew him through APP later. And uh, he and his wife, Cleo, visited my home uh, here in Mexico. And I would definitely describe him as a, a colleague and friend. They're lovely people. Lovely people. Absolutely. So, now, let's talk a little bit about your book you've written. Um, it's called The Piercing Bible. It's amazing. It's a huge inspiration to a lot of piercers. Yes, that's exactly it. Um, what what transcended into writing this book? Why did you want to write this book? Well, this one is the second edition, and I did not want to write this. I was hoping somebody else would write a piercing book, and I wouldn't have to. But the first one came out in 2009, and by 2019, uh, a new edition was sorely needed, and my publisher authorized the second edition right around when we went into lockdown for the pandemic. So uh, that was what I was working on uh, during that initial part of the pandemic. And then it came out in June of last year. So it's now a year old. Um, and I would like to tell you a little bit more about that book, but I would also like to tell you about how the first book came about, if you'd like to hear about that. I would love to hear it. Yes, please. Okay. I was at an APP conference and uh, a woman came up to me and she said, hi, my name is Lee and I'm not a piercer, but I am a piercing fan. And I was wondering if you'd ever thought about writing a book about piercing. And I said, well, I certainly have thought about writing a book about piercing. There definitely needs to be one, but uh, it isn't something I've started and I run a studio and this and that. And she said, well, I have started writing a book, but I am not a piercer, and I was hoping to collaborate with a piercer to complete the book and get it published. So we exchanged information. I told her I was interested, and then we met up. She came to New Orleans, where I was living, um, and we discussed it at length, and I looked over what she had started, and I, I thought that we had a very similar approach, and we decided to collaborate on the book. So we worked together on it. Uh, I worked on that book for close to five years before getting it published. And uh, it's kind of a long story that I won't go into all the details, but somewhere along the way, she decided it should be my book and she dropped out of the project and I was able to get it published. I got a deal with a, it was an independent publisher at the time, uh, 10 Speed Press. And as soon as we signed the contract, they got bought by Random House. And then Random House later combined with Penguin. So Penguin Random House is, I, I think it may be uh, the largest or certainly one of the largest mainstream publishers in the world. And that gives a certain legitimacy to the book, which I think is helpful because it is written not only for people interested in getting piercings, but also for medical professionals who deal with us and parents of people who are interested in piercing and coaches and teachers and uh, there's, it, primarily it's written from the point of view of the piercee, of someone who is interested in, in piercing. And there's certainly plenty of information in there for apprentices and piercers. So it is actually written for anyone with an interest in the subject or need to know anything about it. There's also some history in there. There's a lot of practical information. It, it's The new one is a 370 pages worth of fairly small print. So it is That's a, a lot, lot of information. Of, Info. It's not everything I wanted to put in. That's one of the things about having a publisher is they're kind of in charge of how many photos and illustrations and how many words. And uh, the original manuscript was 157,000 words and they wanted to know, can I cut it down to 100,000? And I said, no, even with the most judicious editing, that would not be the comprehensive book that needs to exist. 
I want to get it published, but I'm going to say no deal if you won't let me have more words. So we settled on 133,000. And I don't even know how many is in the new book, but it's a lot of words. It's it's a fantastic book. It's it's everything a shop should have. And as a consumer of piercings, like you can really research your piercing and understand what you're getting before you actually go in there and know what right and wrong is. It's so important. Yeah. Knowledge is the key for everything. Absolutely. I think it helps people with reasonable expectations. And when clients have those expectations, uh, then piercers need to kind of come up to standards to meet them or the clients are going to say this doesn't seem right and they're going to go somewhere else. So I think it sort of helps to bring up the level all the way around by educating the consumers and the piercers. And um, for the second edition, I brought in a lot of help. So I brought in Jeff Saunders, who is also a past APP president and past uh, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award winner in the organization. And he's a super great guy. And I had him come in as a contributor because I have been sticking with the nipple and genital piercings for so long. I needed a lot of input about all of the other piercings that are going on. And I also set up some piercer groups online and had uh, a domestic small group of hand-picked piercers that are colleagues, a large group of U.S. piercers. I also had a uh, group of foreign piercers. And we also, with the APP, did a piercer survey where we surveyed uh, close to a thousand piercers on everything from studio practices and jewelry and um, training to income levels and home ownership. Like it just covers, a, I think there were about 60 questions on the questionnaire. So I brought all of this in from all these different avenues to really make it more of a community based um, compilation. So it's not just my opinion, it's got a lot of other piercers in there for their opinions and support. Thank you for doing that. It helps everyone so much to get a base idea of what we're getting involved with, whether it's a career with piercing, whether you're getting a single piercing, or if, like you said, you're in the medical field and you don't know how to deal with these things because it is different than a normal wound. So It is. Um, yes. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the genital piercings and nipple piercings. Now, that's pretty much all you do these days, and do you have a shop anymore, or is it only traveling? That is exactly all I do. I specialize exclusively in nipple and genital piercings. I closed my studio in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, but I had bought my house in Mexico that month before the storm happened. So I was planning to move anyway. And I was uh, not sure what I would do once I moved to Mexico, but it just, again, it was sort of this natural progression of things. Once I got the book written and published, I started guest piercing. And so, uh, I do guest piercing in the studios of my colleagues who are also members of the Association of Professional Piercers, and I book my appointments online. I do anatomy consultations online because the piercings I do are so highly anatomically dependent, and so people send me photos, and I uh, evaluate them, and then if they appear suited to the piercing or piercings of interest, then we, we book in. So I pierced before the APP conference. I spent two days in Vegas and I did 43 nipple and genital piercings in two days. Wow, wow. I might have to hit you up on that next year if you're coming back out here. Okay. So um, now I'm if people it. wanted to get a hold of you to get to do a piercing like this, they just basically go to your website and they can book their appointment and like just gotta wait till you come to their town. Is that how that works? Or they might have to travel a little bit or? Yeah, a lot of my clients travel um, sometimes from out of the country. Uh, I had a client who came to Vegas from Canada, and so we joked about meeting in the middle. Uh, okay. I live down south. She lives up north. But, um, yeah, so uh, the pandemic definitely put a big uh, kink in my usual schedule, and I have not been touring much since the pandemic. I'm not sure what the future holds, but I will be in Detroit next. And okay. I filled up, filled up five days and added two more. So I do have some slots open. Also, I do anatomy consultations for anyone and also piercing problem consultations. So if somebody has 
gone to a piercer and had a problem and their piercer isn't able to help them uh, or they don't trust the piercer, which is sometimes the case, then they can come to me online and send me pictures and I can do my best to advise them based on my long experience. So, so yeah, I do anatomy consults and uh, piercing problem consults. Also placement, you know, somebody will say, where should I get my nostril piercing for my nose? Where would it look best? And I will provide people with information for that too. So all that happens. Uh, starts through my website, piercingbible.com, okay. and uh, it, people can sign up for a consult or request an appointment there, and uh, that's where it happens. So then you also do some sort of coaching for piercers as well, correct? I do, yes. So that was kind of how I pivoted to online work when I was staying home, but I'm continuing to do that. So it is one-on-one -on -one online coaching for professional piercers. I'm not teaching people how to pierce. You have to okay. already come with that knowledge. So it's for professionals and it's to polish their skills or help them with certain piercings. And people go to the website, piercingbible.com. Uh, piercers will go there to apply. And if I think someone's needs are a fit with my knowledge base and what I can share with them, we set up a time to meet online uh, like Zoom or Skype. And sometimes I'll do presentations like I do at APP, or sometimes I'll do Q&A sessions where people ask me questions. But I, I met up with a student that I had a coaching session with. He had come to me for septum piercing help, and he said that it changed his life. He went from it being his most feared and hated piercing to his favorite one. So that was really exciting to hear that feedback. Thank you very much for that. It's all you have to do is reach out and ask. Sometimes we're so bashful and shy and we're willing to, to share this knowledge. You just got to reach out and ask people. So if you don't know, ask Elaine. She's amazing. So awesome. if I know, I'm happy to share whatever I can. Now, if we already have the old edition of the piercing Bible and we want to upgrade to the new edition, how do we get a hold of the new piercing Bible? Uh, and I would suggest you do that because it's really completely renovated. Um, so if, even if you have the old one, you definitely do not have this one. You can get this book if you want a signed copy. You can get it through my website, piercingbible.com. Um, there's a, a book icon there. And uh, you get a signed copy there. There's also links on where you can get it on Amazon. It's available where books are sold. It's a, a mainstream regular book. Um, but I think the best way is getting one through my website. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with us today. I really appreciate it. And I also want to say thank you for writing the Piercing Bible. It's really helped our whole community. And the last thing I would like to ask you is if you have any advice to new piercees as far as getting pierced, do you have anything you'd like to uh, let the world know? Uh, well, before I, I do that, I want to say thank you, Scott, for what you do to educate folks in our community and those who make use of our services. So keep up the great work doing your videos and educating folks out there. And thank you very much for having me on. Um, as far as new PRCs go, uh, honestly, honestly and truly, if you want to be a well-educated consumer, I really do suggest you read the book. That's what it's for. And I I would say, I know it's not, it is a commercial, but it's not because I really believe that when consumers are well-educated, they have better results. They're less likely to run into problems. They have realistic expectations. They find piercers who will do a good job. If something comes up, they have access to how to troubleshoot. So being a good... Uh, and well-educated consumer is really helpful to getting good piercings. It really is. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a pleasure. So what do you think of this interview? You wanna see more? Let me know in the comments. Now, if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed, hit the like button, and of course, keep putting holes your body. We'll see you all in the next video.